Okay, I'm sorry, I'm gonna just ask one more time. Everybody can see me, hear me, and see the slides. Okay, thank you guys. So tonight we're talking about um, the thyroid diagnosis and treatment from a holistic perspective. And for those of you just joining again, I'm Dr. John Ripple with Jacksonville Health and Wellness Center. So we're gonna get uh, right into it. I'm gonna go to the next slide here. And the outline for tonight's lecture, we're gonna be talking about the incidence, signs and symptoms, causes and complications of the thyroid, some key concepts. Anytime you see the KISS marker there, we're gonna, some kind of a point to just take home and remember, but it's the keep it simple, stupid principle. So I'll, you'll see those on a couple of slides and they're just really important points uh, for take home message. We'll talk about the diagnostics, and then of course, we're gonna talk about treatment. So just to get started, we're gonna be talking about the thyroid, which is an endocrine gland. And endocrine glands make up the endocrine system. And they simply produce hormones. And hormones are chemicals that travel long distances to convey some sort of information. So two important concepts as we move forward is hormones can be produced endogenously, meaning produced by the body. So our body produces thyroid hormones and the pancreas produces insulin. Exogenous hormones are those hormones that are given from outside in. So this would be from hormone replacement therapy, medications. Um, even some of the foods that we eat, like injections of bovine growth hormone, into cows, um, that's a particular type of hormone. There are also hormone memetics. These are uh, a lot of times just toxins that are found in the environment. One of them um, are plasticizers that mimic um, certain pathways and destroy certain pathways that estrogen and progesterone are responsible for. What is a thyroid? The thyroid gland sits right um, in front of the throat here and it controls the way our body uses it, which we refer to as metabolism, growth and development, body temperature, early childhood brain development, and influences to our heart, muscle, bone, and cholesterol. Um, so, you know, our digestive system takes the food in and breaks it down, but to then take those small components, like the sugar molecule, get it into the cell, to burn it for energy, for ATP, that's all done in concert with the thyroid gland. That's what we talk about when we talk about somebody's metabolism. The thyroid gland produces two major hormones. One is called T3 and the other one is called T4. So the take home message here, and it's important to remember these two hormones, the T stands for tyrosine, which is an amino acid. And the three signifies that there are three iodine molecules that are surrounding this tyrosine molecule. T4 refers to the fact that there are four iodine molecules surrounding the tyrosine molecule. So in order to make these thyroid hormones, we need an amino acid called tyrosine and we need iodine. But what I want you to remember from this slide is T4 is the inactive form of the thyroid hormone and T3 is going to be the one that is used by the body. And we'll get more into this in a few minutes. Incidence. More than 12% of the United States population will develop a thyroid condition during their lifetime. And 60% of them will remain unaware. So there is, even with, not in these statistics, is a category called subclinical hypothyroidism. So you may be scratching your head and say, God, the symptoms we're going to talk about in a few minutes, I have all of them. But every time I get my blood work, uh, my thyroid hormones are normal. Um, well, there's another subset called subclinical hypothyroidism, meaning it's not showing up yet in the blood work, but you still have a lot of the signs and symptoms that we're talking about. 80% of thyroid diseases are caused, are diagnosed, what we call hypothyroidism. And hypo refers to under or decreased. So it'd be decreased production of T3 and T4. And 20% of the thyroid disease cases are diagnosed as hyperthyroidism. And that would 
we refer to um, as the thyroid gland producing too much of the thyroid hormones T3 and T4. An estimated 27 million Americans have some form of thyroid disease. And again, this doesn't include those categories of subclinical hypothyroidism. 200 worldwide, women are definitely more affected by thyroid conditions than men, although men do get hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism, but it's a five to eight times more likely um, that women will have a thyroid condition than a man. One woman in eight will develop a thyroid disorder during their lifetime. Undiagnosed thyroid disease may put patients at risk for certain serious conditions. So if you haven't been diagnosed or is being diagnosed poorly, you're at a, a greater risk for cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, infertility, fetal complications for pregnant moms. Hashimoto's, as you're gonna hear that term quite a bit, is the number one cause of hypothyroidism in the United States, and it's five times more common in women than men. It is most commonly treated as a thyroid disorder rather than what it truly is, which is an autoimmune condition. And even going a step further, it remains undiagnosed. So they don't even look for it. But as you're going to see, it will change the entire treatment protocol as far as how you're going to be handling or treating your thyroid condition. 40% of the people already taking thyroid meds still have abnormal TSH readings and their need for meds increase over time. And all this means, for those of you who have a thyroid condition, you know You've heard of TSH. It's a hormone produced by the brain called thyroid stimulating hormone. But for people who are not familiar with this particular hormone, all this means is that most of the people who have thyroid conditions, it's being mismanaged. Um, their need for hormone increases over time, and they still have abnormal readings in the blood. So initially, you may feel great with taking your thyroid meds when you first get diagnosed for a long-term strategy, it's very ineffective. And that's probably because you're not treating the cause, it's just a suppression of symptoms. 50% of children with parents have a thyroid disorder, may develop a thyroid disorder themselves by age 40. Like you showed there, obviously, it is some genetic predisposition. So, signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism. Again, this is the thyroid condition that is underproducing T3 and T4. So we have fatigue. Increased sensitivity to cold, constipation, dry skin, unexplained weight gain, puffy face, hoarseness, elevated blood cholesterol levels, muscle aches, tenderness, stiffness, irregular menstrual periods, thinning hair, slow heart rate, depression, impaired memory. The biggest signs I'm just going to point out are fatigue, sensitivity to cold, weight gain, thinning hair, and some line on the continuum of depression impaired memory. So it may not look like full-blown depression um, and in, impaired memory, but it could be brain fog and it could be just quality of life and, and the happiness quotient is not a 10 out of 10. Maybe you're grading it you know, at a 5 out of 10, so it's not clinical depression. But those are the, the major signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism. Hyperthyroidism is, is the opposite. So we do get, we actually get weight loss. Uh, we get an increased heart rate. We get nervousness, anxiety, irritability, tremor, sweating, changes again in menstrual cycles, increased sensitivity to heat. Hypothyroidism was an increased sensitivity to cold, but with hyperthyroidism, things are overactive and metabolism is too hot. So we have a sensitivity to extra heat. Fatigue, muscle weakness, difficulty sleeping, skin thinning, fine little hair, and changes in bowel patterns. And the most common symptoms here are going to be the nervousness, anxiety, tr and the tremors uh, and the heart rate. Those are the, the telltale sign of somebody suffering with hypothyroidism. Lots of causes for hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism. If we start on the hypothyroidism side, Thyroid surgery, obviously, if you have your thyroid removed, you're going to have a decreased production of the thyroid hormone.
hormones, if people are going undergoing cancer treatment and they have radiation therapy in the area, they're going to get an effect on decreased production of thyroid hormones. Medications like lithium, it can be congenital. Uh, pituitary, that basically is uh, in the brain, and so there could be issues with the brain communication with the thyroid. Iodine deficiency and pregnancy. When we look at hyperthyroidism, um, we have hyperfunctioning nodules, which we have uh, growth, um, benign, usually benign growths of the thyroid. And then we have something called thyroiditis, which is inflammation of the thyroid gland. I purposely didn't discuss the autoimmune because I want to focus in on that. Because most people, when they think of thyroid issues, they automatically think, okay, iodine deficiency. And that is true throughout the entire world but not in the United States. We don't have cases of hypothyroidism due to decreased iodine. We have plenty of iodine. Most people in the United States are not iodine deficient. The cases of hypothyroidism around the world are in third world countries where the soil is deficient and they don't have the nutrient reserves um, that we are fortunate to have here. The number one cause of hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism revolves around the immune system, and it's called autoimmunity. With hypothyroidism, it's called Hashimoto's, and with autoimmune, it's called Graves. Those names are just, you know, people shouldn't name things after themselves, but they're just named after Dr. Hashimoto, and, and they, they don't really have any clinical significance. Hashimoto's is just a form of autoimmunity. Autoimmunity is the body viewing certain tissues and glands in the body as a foreign invader and then getting out the artillery and it starts to attack it. So in this case, the body's immune system is recognizing the thyroid gland as a foreign invader and it begins a process of attacking it. As it attacks it, it decreases its function, and then we get, or in the case of hypo, Hashimoto's, or hyper, we have Graves' disease. Complications, if you don't have this treated appropriately, there's all sorts of complications on both ends. Heart is, is really a big issue. Uh, mental health-related issues is another big issue. Neuropathy, which is nerve pain birth defects, thyrotoxic crisis, and hyperthyroidism is, uh, could, could cause a fatal death. Um, I had a patient, uh, a colleague, who brought his daughter in. Um, she was suffering with schizophrenia. And she had, she's about 14 years old, and, and she was homebound for about two years. And it came to be that she had undiagnosed Hashimoto's and her antibodies were just off the roof. If you were to go online and go to PubMed, which is, holds all of the research articles, and you type in Hashimoto's and schizophrenia, you're going to see huge correlations. What we, most people though, are gonna have something on the spectrum of mental health related issues. Again, falling in the lines of brain fog and depression and those types of things, but if it's a really severe case, it can create massive problems in the body, um, which can, in some cases, lead to even linkages to uh, schizophrenia, especially with Hashimoto's. Okay, so here's the KISS symbol. Keep it simple, stupid. We're, first key concept we want to talk about is hormonal complexity dictates a multidimensional treatment and not a single drug therapy. You don't go to the doctor with hypothyroidism and the only treatment that you are given is armor, which is a pill, or synthroid. And that's the end of the story. There is so much more that can be done and that's not enough. So we have a very confusing slide here, but I just wanna make a point and I'm gonna bring your attention to the brain and we have the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland produces a hormone called thyroid stimulating hormone. It's one of the few hormones that are named appropriately because it goes to the thyroid gland and it stimulates it to produce the thyroid hormones T3, 
and T4. So if you remember, T4 is inactive and T3 is active. The reason why the body does that is because if it wants to travel, it has to be in an inactive form. So the thyroid gland produces primarily um, a small portion, about 20% of T3, and about 80% of the inactive form, T4. It then gets shuttled to the liver. The liver does conversions of T4 into T3. It then gets shuttled into the gut, and the bacteria actually play a big part in this, and they convert T4 into T3. So why are we going through this physiology? Partially just to bring home the point, is the problem with the brain communicating with the thyroid? Is the problem with the thyroid gland not having the right nutrients like tyrosine and iodine? Is the problem with the body not converting the thyroid hormones in the liver? Is the problem with the body not converting the thyroid hormones in the GI system? You have a patient who has constipation and diarrhea, who drinks uh, lots of alcohol, and they have some small amounts of clinical hypothyroidism. We want to be targeting the liver and the colon because we're gonna get conversion of the thyroid hormones which will impact their blood work in their body. And it may not be a, just a thyroid issue, meaning a need for just a medication. We have to have a very complex or multidimensional treatment plan. And that's because the body is very multidimensional, right? So this slide, although confusing, just points us in the direction to say, yeah, there's no way that just one a medication is gonna be the only thing um, to help me if I have hypothyroidism or hypothyroidism. Adrenal glands. If you have stress, and who does not have stress? I mean, these signs and symptoms of adrenal dysfunction, fatigue, GI problems, autoimmunity, loss of libido, weight loss, gain, hit infections, non-heart-related cardiac symptoms, meaning increased, increased respiration, but they're not coming from the heart. They're being sped up because the adrenal glands are producing epinephrine, sleep disorders, mood disorders, blood sugar issues, and so forth. We all suffer from some degree of adrenal issues. Adrenal glands sit on top of our kidney and they produce a very well-known hormone called cortisol, which most people refer to as the stress hormone. But the key here that I just wanna bring a point home is that when high levels of cortisol in the body inhibit the conversion of T4 to T3, in the blood work, you will see this as a marker called reverse T3. If it's elevated, it means that the adrenal glands are taking the T4 and they are converting it once again into an inactive form we call reverse T3. We'll go over that again at the very end where we list all the diagnostics that are important to get. The point here is just to, to just bring in again that the need for a multidimensional plan and possibly looking at the cortisol levels and the adrenal dysfunction as it relates to the thyroid. So it brings us to what we call functional versus conventional endocrinology. Traditional approach is the replacement model. You have low testosterone, let's give you testosterone. You have low progesterone, let's give you progesterone. And they have two ways that they can do this. They can do it age appropriately. You're 50 year old male with low testosterone. We're gonna look up what should a 50 year old male have testosterone, we're gonna give you that or they can decide 50 year old male, low testosterone, I wanna give you testosterone levels that mimic somebody in their 20 years, 20 years of age. That's the traditional conventional replacement model. The functional model is the restoration of the body's ability to produce its own endogenous hormones. Remember exogenous is from the outside in, that would be your drugs, but functional endocrinology, which is what we're talking about, is trying to figure out why it's happening. Why do you have low thyroid levels? Why is it low testosterone? And figuring out what the cause is 
and restoring the body's ability to be able to produce those endogenous hormones. And that is a functional medicine approach to endocrinology. And it's a very um, comprehensive treatment. Okay, key concept two, tissue saturation. The more hormone you take, the more you increase your reliance. How does the body normally regulate hormones? If the brain detects low hormones in the blood, it spits out hormones to increase the body's production of hormones. But if you are taking a hormone, whether it be thyroid or testosterone, the body feels in the blood and senses that there's plenty of hormone being circulated. So the body stops getting signals for your body to produce any more of whatever particular hormone you're taking and that gland begins to atrophy. And I call this chemical incarceration because it's the same story where someone says, yes, I want to do this, I do. But when I come off of my hormone medication, I feel horrible. Of course, because it will take months in order to reactivate or resuscitate the gland that has atrophy to tell it to start kicking in more of its own endogenous production. And this is where people get trapped because they say, I tried coming off my medication and it just didn't work, I felt worse. But you have to bring that into awareness. What we typically do with our patients with, with hormone challenges that they're trying to come off is you, you basically decrease the hormone that they're taking, um, the medication, at the same time you're doing more of a holistic approach. So that way there's less of that period where they don't feel very well. And um, it's just a different different approach, but you have to recognize that tissue, it's all tissue saturation, and it incarcerates you for lifetime reliance on that particular hormone. And this is true with all medications, by the way. Whether it's blood pressure medication, doesn't make a difference. This is true with most medications because you stop the body's ability to do it. So, we just have to be aware of that. This could happen. You want to obviously have guidance by doing this. You don't want to obviously ever come off of your medication without speaking with your, your physician. Treatment should be given to treat the cause, not the symptom. I would say most people would agree with this, but I would say, although most people agree with this, the majority of people who get treated don't actually being treated for the cause, but they're, they're being treated for the symptom. So we'll talk about Hashimoto's because it's the number one cause of hypothyroidism in the United States. And you can target the thyroid gland or you can target what it is, an autoimmune condition, and you can target the immune system. Now this is, you know, kind of, it sounds like out in left field, but 70% of the body's immune system is housed in the gastrointestinal tract. So a big part of autoimmune treatment, whether it's MS, which is in the brain, Crohn's disease in the gut, rheumatoid arthritis, is to target the immune system because they all have very similar common causes and you're wanting to target the immune system and most of the body's immune system is targeting the GI system. And we will discuss that in a few moments when we talk about uh, the treatment. So causes of Hashimoto's, it's really, there's really not one cause, it's really compounding. There is a genetic predisposition. Leaky gut is the consensus amongst the scientific community of why all autoimmune conditions occur. Xenobiotic exposure, this is exposure to foreign substances. Because it's an autoimmune condition, if you have hardware in your body, like um, screws or plates in your knee, or you had uh, breast augmentation, you have an increased risk of bringing to life an autoimmune condition. Um, and a xenobiotic is just a fancy word for it something called foreign to life, so things entering the body that are man-made. Gluten plays a huge role in Hashimoto's. The gluten molecule 
looks like the thyroid gland. If the gluten molecule is not digested appropriately, you get antibodies produced against the, the, the gluten molecule, and then the antibodies that are left over begin to attack the thyroid gland. And we'll, we'll show you in a slide how that happens. Enteric bacteria, this is, you know, we've all heard of good bacteria, bad bacteria in our gut. When you have more bad bacteria than good bacteria, you're going to have an issue that could develop, um, in this case, a compounding to create Hashimoto's. Remember, the gut does conversion of the T4 hormone into the active form T3. Insulin resistance, altered estrogen metabolism. This is mostly people who are estrogen dominant. Uh, for women, this would be people who have increased levels of estrogen and decreased levels of progesterone, puts you more at risk for developing Hashimoto's. Nutritional deficiencies, vitamin D, selenium, zinc, iodine, vitamin E, and of course, diet and lifestyle. So these are some of the causes that create Hashimoto's. And it's a perfect storm when your genetics meet digestive issues, meet a really poor diet on processed foods and breads and pastas, things that are made up with high levels of gluten, you can bring this to life rather quickly. I have three research articles. Um, I'm just going to briefly talk about why I put them down here. This first research article, and, and you're going to have my email address at the end, so if you want links to these uh, articles or these research articles, let me know. I'll be happy to send you them. This one is from Dr. Pisano from 2012. And all it's saying is that the cause of autoimmune conditions is in the intestinal tract. He even goes to say in the red, he suggests that these processes, meaning autoimmunity, can be arrested, stopped, by reestablishing intestinal barrier function, which is just another fancy way of saying healing the gastrointestinal. Celiac disease connection and the gluten connection. So the first the celiac disease connection states, we suggest a serological screening, blood screening for celiac disease in all patients with autoimmune thyroid disease. And the other one is anticholiatin, which is a gluten sensitivity, was diagnosed in most patients studied with autoimmune thyroiditis. So two points here. If you have an autoimmune condition, the chances of you having another autoimmune condition is extremely high, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent likelihood that you're going to find some other autoimmune condition lurking. So celiac disease is, in essence, a, a genetic disorder. It's an, it's an autoimmune condition. And gluten sensitivity is just that. You're sensitive to the gluten molecule. In celiac disease, it's more severe. Gluten sensitivity, you could think of as more mild or moderate. But the bottom line is, if you have hypothyroidism, more than likely, the research is telling us that you have an issue with the gluten protein, which is found in certain grains. And we'll, we'll, we'll show you which ones those are. So you need to eliminate gluten. There's no way to fix the thyroid condition when it's real severe especially Hashimoto's, if you're eating gluten containing products. Uh, we don't have as much success with our patients if they're still eating gluten. So this is a really important one to take out of the diet, especially for weight loss. Um, this could be a trap. And the problem here, I don't have this research article, but we're talking about the research shows that, you know, the amount of gluten that you can put on your finger will trigger an antibody response close to three to six plus months. So unfortunately, it's not a decrease in gluten. It unfortunately is an all or nothing approach um, in order to combat this particular disease. This is just a pictorial showing, this is the gut lining here, and that red arrow is showing that the materials, the gluten molecules and so forth are breaking through this gut barrier and entering into the bloodstream. And many things can cause this uh, intestinal barrier to be disrupted in the GI system, from drugs that people are taking to poor diet, to inflammation, and over time it just gets weaker and weaker. And when that happens, the food 
which should be broken down into small components. So the analogy that we use, we, we talked about in the videos, is we eat food as large macromolecules, carbs and fats and protein. You can think of it as a beaded necklace. And the whole point of digestion is to break all of those into individual beads. So the big carbohydrate necklace is broken down into a sugar. The big protein molecule is broken down into an amino acid. The big fatty acid molecule is broken down into a fatty acid. So in the GI system, the purpose is to break down this beaded necklace and push out single beads into the bloodstream. The body understands and recognizes those as friendly. The sugar it takes to produce energy, the amino acid to build muscle, and the fatty acid to build hormones. But if you have a leak in your gastrointestinal tract, the necklace is not broken down into a single bead, and three, four pieces of the necklace go into the bloodstream, and the body recognizes this as a foreign invader, and boom, you get the antibody production. And it just so happens that the gluten molecule looks like the thyroid. So when you look at this pictorial here, um, the blue represents antibody production, and these little red uh, guys in this first uh, slide, part of the slide, represent, say, the food molecules. They're the antigen. So you get antibodies that are taking away pieces of the food. But as you digest the food, what happens in, in the last portion of the slide here is that you're left with these antibodies circulating in your bloodstream because the body makes more antibodies than it needs to take away the food. And then these antibodies go looking. They start looking, if they go to the joints, they're gonna create rheumatoid arthritis. If they circulate to the uh, GI system, they're gonna create Crohn's disease. Um, but these antibodies, let's say these are specific to gluten, they have an affinity for the thyroid gland and actually for brain tissue. And that's why we get some of those brain-related issues like schizophrenia, mental health disorders, and so forth. Fourth concept, diet and lifestyle directly influence your hormone production. So this is a, just a classic example of mismanagement in states. So we have a man in his, say, 50s. He's overweight, 50 pounds. He goes to the doctor. And he says, Doc, I just my lost my libido, my energies are low. The doc runs a blood panel on him and finds he has low testosterone. He says, Yep, you need testosterone shots. And the guy says, Great. And he starts with his testosterone shots. Interesting thing though, we're talking about diet and lifestyle, is when you increase body fat. What happens in men, it's called aromatization. They have, you know, they have medications that stop this process or try to stop it. But when you have extra fat on your body, testosterone goes into the fat tissue and gets converted into estrogen. That's why men who are overweight get more feminizing features. They get breasts and they have their figure changes. And so they kind of feminize. And women's the exact opposite. Their estrogen, if they have extra fat tissue, their estrogen gets pushed into the fat tissue and what comes out is increased testosterone. So as women increase in weight, they get more quote unquote masculine features. So go back to the doctor and just prescribe the testosterone shot, which that person would be incarcerated now for the rest of his life. Wouldn't it make more sense for the doctor to say, listen, I think you can get your testosterone levels back to normal if you lose about 40 pounds. Why don't we put you on a diet first? How do you work with a nutritionist? Let's have you come back in six months and see where your testosterone levels are. Right? Isn't that the appropriate way? Because otherwise this guy goes out and he feels great temporarily with the testosterone. Does he change his diet and lifestyle? Absolutely not. This applies 100% to thyroid as well. If you're not changing the cause, you're still ruining the body. And you, 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 that's what you really need to be you know, emphasizing, treatment of cause. And, and for thyroid conditions, I mean, that can be accomplished. A big part of the treatment plan is really diet and lifestyle, as we've seen in just a moment. Okay, so here is a very important slide. And this is the diagnostic uh, testing that you should be getting. 
So typically what's run is if they're just doing a screen, you're going to get TSH, which is thyroid stimulant. If you're going to an endocrinologist, they're going to run TSH, T3, and T4. But you really don't have many people running reverse T3. And if you remember, that is what is the influence of the adrenal glands and stress on the thyroid. And they're not running Hashimoto's and Graves' disease antibodies. So if you suspect that you have a thyroid condition, Next time, if you're a patient of ours, we want to get blood work, we need to run a complete thyroid panel. If you have an endocrinologist right now that you're working with, you need to have them run a complete thyroid panel. The reason why they don't run the Hashimoto's antibodies is because to an endocrinologist, it makes no difference if you have Hashimoto's or if you have just quote unquote hypothyroidism. Because remember, the conventional treatment for uh, hormones is the replacement model. So the treatment is exactly the same. If you have Hashimoto's, they give you Synthroid or Armour, which are two thyroid medications. If you don't have Hashimoto's, they give you Synthroid and Armour. It doesn't make a difference to them. From a functional perspective, from a holistic perspective, and I, and I never want to use the word alternative because it's not alternative. Alternative to what? The right way to be treating? What you're wanting to do then is target the treatment towards the cause, not the symptom. So you want to get a complete thyroid panel. You want to get food sensitivity panels, especially you know, because of the linkage from celiac and gluten. You want to check gluten but you also want to check if you possibly have other food challenging issues. Now you're not going to get all of these tests at once. This is something that you kind of, you know, look at your history and think about what are the most important ones. You, need, you know, discuss this with your physician as far as how you're able to accomplish and which one should be prioritized. But food sensitivities, if you have a food sensitivity, that's going to create inflammation and that's going to create antibody production and that will in turn increase the autoimmunity. So it's really important to find out what foods you're sensitive to. You wanna get other autoimmune markers. Remember we said, if it, especially if it shows up that you have Hashimoto's or Graves' disease, the chances of you having other autoimmune conditions are pretty high. AMA is a general marker for autoimmunity. Rheumatoid arthritis, or RA, checks for rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune condition. There's so many other immune markers. Um, there's a really specialized lab called Cyrex that can actually give you um, whether or not you have the possibility of developing multiple sclerosis and other types of neurological diseases, you know, um, from Alzheimer's and so forth. They're not covered by insurance, and it's a pretty expensive test. But um, if you are showing that you're having multiple autoimmune uh, conditions showing up in your blood work, it, it may be something that you may want to get for developing a strong preventative strategy. We talked about celiac and gluten sensitivity. Uh, functional gastrointestinal panel. <laughs> Why? Because, as we said, the cause of autoimmunity is in the GI system. So. It makes sense to look at what's going on inside the gastrointestinal tract. Is there leaky gut? What's the status of the bacteria? Remember, they help with the conversion. Um, in, in my estimation, if you didn't get any two tests, then those, the thyroid panel and, and functional gastrointestinal, um, that's a, a must because you got to find out if you do have leaky gut. Full body autoimmunity, we talked about that. Vitamin D levels. Uh, vitamin D levels are, vitamin D, first of all, is a hormone, and it has a strong association with increasing um, somebody's immune system. You know, you get the old wives' tale that when the cold winter comes, um, we are suspect to more um, colds because of the cold weather, but really the issue is decreased vitamin D production. So because vitamin D is associated with the body's immune system, high levels of vitamin D, you have increased immunity, low levels of vitamin D, you get a decreased immunity. So it's really important to get your vitamin D levels checked. They should be over 50. 
if you have Hashimoto's, it's, it's working to talk with your physician. You may even want to up over 60 um, from the therapeutic standpoint to really help to boost up the body's immune system. The adrenal glands um, are really important to, to monitor, especially if you're the type of person who's having sleep disorders, if you are having libido issues, really, really strong fatigue issues, and just plain old stress, whether it be real, imaginary stress, physical stress, chemical stress from the food you're eating, emotional stress. That's a really, really important panel to obtain because it may mean that you work on the adrenal glands for two, three months and see how your thyroid hormones do. Maybe we don't even touch the thyroid panel, right? Because if we know you have lots of stress in your body, it's definitely going to affect the production of thyroid hormone. So here's uh, the treatment. So step one, you need to order the appropriate diagnostics, which we just talked about. So bare minimum, you want to get the complete thyroid panel and make sure you ask to get the antibodies. Step two is you got to start with diet and lifestyle. So we put our patients and challenge them to go on a whole food plant-based diet. We're simply challenging people to eat more fruits, more vegetables in their whole form. And I'll show you why in a moment. Self-care, chronobiology, Obviously, it's a fancy word for sleep, but your hormones are affected by the rhythm of your sleep patterns. You wake up in the morning, the sun shines, it stimulates photoreceptors in your eyes, and it starts the decreased production of cortisol throughout the day. The sun goes down, melatonin comes up, and all of these have a domino effect on your adrenals and your thyroid and so forth. So sleep cycles are really important with any hormone-related issue. Exercise is really important to stimulate the hormone production, especially um, strength training. Um, there's lots of different exercise programs that you can do, but you want to have a nice balance of aerobic and strength training and flexibility. And step three, specific to the thyroid, is a program that was, <coughs> excuse me, developed by the Institute for Functional Medicine. It's called the 4R program. And I'll be go over it um, on one of the next slides. This is the reason why we're using a plant-based diet. So those of you who have been with me through many of my lectures, this slide is probably real familiar to you. I think it really just proves the point though, because when we eat food, let's say the average American meal, you know, like a hamburger at McDonald's, there are one billion microorganisms, bugs, in that meal. Most of them are dead. The GI system has to distinguish which things are friend, what you know, what are the nutrients in the food. In the case of McDonald's hamburger, there are no nutrients. It has to distinguish between friend and foe, and whatever's foe is going to poop it out. Half of the dry weight of your poop is bacteria. So you eat a hamburger, it's, it's sifting through wherever the nutrient might be. Maybe there's one nutrient, and uh, it takes the rest of the bacteria that are present, all the microorganisms, and it, it compacts it into your poop. What just happened there is that you had an immune response. The body's immune response was true to deal with this impact of the one billion mi microorganisms that just invaded your body. And that's why the body put the immune system 70% in the gastrointestinal tract. But go down all the way to a plant-based meal. 500 microorganisms per meal. So your sweet potatoes with steamed veggies has, you know, if you're eating, say, the standard American meal, it has a one billion to million fold increase in inflammation. Remember, number one cause of hypothyroidism is autoimmunity. This is inflammation. This is your immune system. You want to arrest your immune system and push it down. There is nothing stronger. No medication can come even close than switching to a whole food, plant-based diet. That's why we encourage our patients with hypothyroidism to switch over to a whole food, plant-based diet. So these are the food groups. Briefly, we're going to go over this. We got, I think we got two more slides. There's not 82 on the bottom if you're seeing that. So there's, there's a plenty, there's only a few more slides left. But 
we have here vegetables we want to eat in abundance specifically to thyroid conditions and autoimmunity there there's some um reason to believe that there's a family of vegetables called the nightshade vegetables which is potatoes and tomatoes and root plant and, and peppers that these foods um and they're most of those are really fruit but anyways those foods could trigger um a lot of immune response so this goes with that sensitivity testing i think it's more valuable to like individualize what you're sensitive to but you might see this when you're you know, diving around on the internet you may want to experiment with eliminating some of the nightshade uh, vegetables now there's a lot of controversy on this next one and you probably heard of it if you have a thyroid condition about these foods called goyergens not a lot of scientific you know literature really to back those claims up but these are foods that contain chemicals that disrupt the thyroid or are believed to disrupt the thyroid these are crucifer vegetables like broccoli and kale and brussels sprouts some of the most healthiest foods on the planet and then in the legume family um, this is soy our take on it is you know I, I, what we we encourage people to do some people nitpick and you know they're still eating processed food. The diet's really not that great, and they're still nitpicking on some of these you know smaller ideas like the goitrogens. But you know they're not they're missing the big picture. The totality of changing the diet is more important than exclusion of any one food. Um, we use that as a possibility. We kind of put a question mark there. Um, but you know food sensitivity testing is, is probably a better way to go. So you won't drive yourself crazy with eliminating some really healthy foods. Fruit, you want to be really looking at some of the anti-inflammatory foods, especially berries. Um, pineapple has an enzyme in it called bromelain. Papaya has an enzyme in it called papain. Um, spices like ginger and um, turmeric are great as anti-inflammatories as well. Grains, specifically, we want patients to be on a gluten-free diet. Um, and I'll give you a list of what that is in just a moment. Beans and then nuts and seeds. So if we're looking at eating foods in their original state. Um, basically, the paleo diet minus the meat. So don't be can, you know don't be tempted to go on a paleo diet in the sense that you know, especially if you're dealing with an issue uh, as severe as Hashimoto's and it's ruining your life. Um, you're wanting to exclude the animal products to decrease that inflammatory. And you, and you could see a pretty immediate reversal. Gluten. Gluten is a protein found in wheat, rye, barley, oats, root, spelt, and trickle. Trickle. Um, any other grain is okay. So you want to avoid these. Oats is really not a, a gluten grain. It just is made in a facility that processes um, gluten. So it's usually contaminated, especially for buying. You know, some at your local uh, non-health food store. You go to your health food store, you can get certified non-gluten or gluten-free oats. But you're wanting to go on a whole food um, grain diet and exclude the gluten grains. So when we talk about whole grains, we're talking about grains in their, their original state. You know, so you take the grain, one part grain, two quarter of your boil, and that simmer, and that's the grain. That's what we want to eat. Now, when you take that grain and start making stuff out of it, you concentrate the sugar. So whether it be a cracker, piece of bread, or a donut, cupcake, and so forth. So we want to, especially in the beginning stages here, we really want to concentrate on whole foods, and that would be the grains in your original state. So we talked about the appropriate diagnostics, making dietary and lifestyle changes, and we're going to briefly end here with the four R. The 4-Hour program, like I mentioned, was developed by the Institute for Functional Medicine, and it's phenomenal in its effect. Um, it could take three months to do. Uh, initially, they had recommended that you do each of these in stages, the removal phase first, then repair, then the re-inoculate and replace. And since then, uh, a lot of physicians have been doing all everything at the same time and actually getting similar results. And, and I've kind of done both. I used to do really 
in phases and now kind of experimenting with doing it all at once, I'm actually seeing similar results. So that's good news. So things can move a little bit quicker. The first phase, though, is something that you're wanting to do by itself, and that is doing a detox cleanse. And there's so many different types of cleanse programs out there. Um, for some people, it's simply just changing your diet to eat healthy. That's a cleanse. Um, there's juice cleansing, there's some vegetable cleansing. Um, we'll have lectures in the future on detoxification, and we can discuss that in more detail. But you know, there's all sorts of stuff on the internet. On our learning center, on our website, we have a little PDF on detoxification guide on juicing, so you can, you can look that up on our website. And I'll give you a link in a moment. The second part is repairing the gut. You want to heal up the gastrointestinal lining, the leaky gut. Because remember, that's where the autoimmune condition is coming from. So you repair the gut. Uh, there are certain nutrients, I'll show you on the next slide, um, that are extremely beneficial for repairing the GI system. You want to re inoculate the gastrointestinal tract with the right type of flora, which is bacteria, probiotics. And so you want to get the nutrients to do that. And replacing the balance, unfortunately, that, that probably needs a little bit of investigation of diagnostics to find out what's the status of your hormones, you know, what can be done holistically about that, what nutrients might be efficient, but you most certainly can do the first three and uh, get, get started with that. Supplements. These are supplements that are specific. Um, to the thyroid, but also specific if you have other issues that are influencing the thyroid gland. So you want to take all of these supplements. So multivitamin, of course, vitamin D, we talked about that. Probiotics or the friendly bacteria. Prebiotics are the food for the probiotics, and they're usually found in the same supplement. Mm -hmm. Thyroid support, especially if you found out certain nutrients that you might be deficient in. Um, you don't want to be taking iodine if you have Hashimoto's, because it could actually be detrimental. You do want to take iodine if you have a thyroid condition that is iodine deficient. So just kind of keep that in mind. That's a, one of those myths out there that everybody with a thyroid issue needs to be taking iodine. If there's issues with your liver, if you drink too much or you know you have too much alcohol or you're one of those people that are just sensitive you know, to medications you're sensitive, or you have a cup of coffee, you know, at 6 o'clock at night, you're up the entire night, your body's just sensitive. It's not cleansing it out as quick as it should be. Um, so you may want to think about cleansing out your liver. These are some nutrients. Remember we said that one of the reasons why you get Hashimoto's is because of the estrogen progesterone ratios. So these are just some uh, telltale you know, uh, herbs that help with rebalancing your progesterone to estrogen balance basically increasing the progesterone and decreasing your estrogen. And they're usually, you wouldn't buy each one of these in a separate, they usually come in, we use a company called Apex Energetics, they usually come together. So uh, there's a supplement we have called Progestate, which helps with progesterone support, has the stuff in it. There's an estrogen one that contains all of those in there. So you wouldn't buy each of these individually. If you're having stress, you, you gotta be taking some um, support for your dream life. And then finally, the GI healing. The big nutrient here is gluten. This is what does the healing in the gastrointestinal tract. We use a product from Apex Energetics called um, Repairbite. It works really well. <clears throat> and it has marshmallow root, slippery elm, essential fatty acids, aloe. And this is a great supplement to kind of help with um, getting your GI system intact. Glutamine is an excitatory neurotransmitter, so um, it is an amino acid, but if you're having mental health issues, um, you definitely want to uh, consult somebody before you begin taking it. As with any supplement, I need to say that with all the stuff here tonight. Obviously, you need to be consulting your physician um, about any treatment that you are going to be deciding to do. So just to recap again, to get the diagnostics, start with the diet and lifestyle change and begin with that 4-R program. This is a slam dunk for thyroid conditions. Um, and the majority of people who have very mild thyroid issues or even subclinical hyperthyroidism, 
So this is really going to make um, a huge difference and possibly reverse that. If your condition is pretty severe and the length of the thyroid condition you've had had gone undiagnosed for a long time, or you've been on thyroid medication for a long time, you may not be able to get off the thyroid medication, but you definitely are going to decrease the amount that you're taking and the future increases as you get older. So I'm going to open it up um, to questions, and I'm going to see there's a couple of ways I think we can do this. I, um, you guys can use the chat on the left-hand side of your screen if somebody has a question, and I think I'm able to um, possibly open up the mic as well. But why don't we start? If anybody has a question, you can go on the, on the chat, and I'll be able to, to see uh, the questions. Our website is www.drrapoli.com. For those of you who are local to Jacksonville, of course, we're uh, in office consulting. And we just started doing some online um, consulting as well. We have technology to kind of do consulting similar to this if you're uh, long distance away. So you can look at that on our website as well under the, the store icon. So we have a question from um, from Katie. Yes, uh, she asked, did I hear you say that you can do all four R's in the program at the same time? <clears throat> and that's correct. Um, right now, it's they used to um, they used to recommend that you do everything in a specific order, but a lot of physicians have been you know showing that they've been actually getting results by doing it all at the same time. This is kind of in its infancy, and so people are experimenting, and I've just started doing that as well, and I've been getting some some good results. So. Um, yeah, that's like actually a change. That's been a change. Uh, question from Daniela. I saw soy on your list of legumes. I've heard soy is bad for the thyroid meds or with Hashimoto's. Um, we briefly talked about that, but soy is considered what they refer to as a goitrogen, and it has chemicals in it that they say can affect the thyroid. And my take on that is, first of all, you're wanting to eat soy in its natural state. So we got edamame, you heat it, curdle it, you make tofu, you ferment it, you make um, tempeh and miso, and that's it. That's the traditional soy-based products, and that's what we recommend. Instead of driving people crazy for some of these goitrogens, uh, we prefer um, sensitivity testing because it's more accurate and it's more individualized. Uh, telling somebody to give up uh, Higher food, uh, especially like the brassica family, which is another goitrogen, um, without really knowing if it's affecting the body. We can actually test for that now. These were really um, uh, pink, uh, you know, things that were, were said in the community as far as for thyroid, with not a lot of research behind it. But today we're able to test these and find out which ones we are having inflammatory issues with. So we have a question here. <clears throat> Could Hashimoto's follicular carcinoma um, or a nodule mimic a shellfish or iodine allergy? Um, not really sure about that question. I mean, as far as the answer to that question. Um, Katie says, I think you suggested that people take the complete thyroid panel and the functional gastrointestinal panel at the very moment. That's correct. Um, it really just depends, you know, with doing a history on a patient. If you look and find the stress to be hugely impacted on the person, we may recommend the adrenal panel over the gastrointestinal panel. It, it just depends um, on each particular one. But definitely, if you're you know, kind of doing this by yourself and it's hard to figure out, that would be a great place to start. Uh, we have a question here from South Carolina. Been diagnosed with hypothyroidism, elevated TSH, <coughs> not other testing done. Should I follow a gluten-free diet for three months before being retested? I had no symptoms 
the hypothyroidism, I follow a whole food plant-based diet for 14 months. No, you can always test your, so the question she's asking, um, do you need to be off gluten and then test? Or do I need to be eating gluten and then test? There's pros and cons to both ways. So bottom line is just, you're gonna be tracking it over time. So I would get a baseline of where you, where you currently are at and look at your antibodies. And then in six months, depending on what you're doing, you retest it and you always are interpreting your blood work um, with whatever's happening in your life. That, that's the best way that you want to interpret your blood work. You don't want to just, you know, if I had somebody's blood work in front of me and I didn't know the person, it would be hard for me to really understand what's going on. So you always want to interpret the blood work based upon what you're doing in your history. And a couple more questions here. Um, we'd be able to get a copy of these slides. Yes, I think we um, go ahead. You're going to, I'll put my email back up. Just email me. And Jill, same thing. Any Anything that you need from the presentation that we did, I'll put my email back up. Just go ahead and email me with whatever it is that you're, you're looking for, and I can try to provide whatever that is. So I thank you guys. Uh, this is, you know, kind of a, a new platform. So, you know, just if any feedback would be awesome um, if this went off well without any glitches. It looks like it did on my end, but I, all I know is I'm talking to a computer, so it's kind of difficult. But um, I appreciate so much for all of you attending and uh, wish you luck on your health journey. Have a great night.